watching a global celebration of all things Notre Dame, where we invite you to watch, connect, give, and vote. This is Notre Dame Day, live from the LaFortune Student Center. Welcome to Notre Dame Day. If you're just joining us for the first time, welcome to our number 13, not quite halfway there yet, of Notre Dame Day. This is a 29-hour global celebration of all things Notre Dame. And we are so excited for what the next hour holds. We have all kinds of things in store for you. Interviews with Senator Joe Donnelly, students who are here on campus who are getting ready to go out into the world and tell us all about their experiences here on campus. And we're also gonna go live to the Basilica of the Sacred Heart and visit with folks there about what this, what this place means to the people who live and work here. We thank you so much for tuning in. I have to give a special shout out to my dad, class of 1974. I got a text from him this morning. It may be early in Missouri, but he is up and watching. So good morning, Dad. And we are going to start off today with an interview with two of our students who have been with us for four years. You guys are getting ready to embark on real life, I guess. But you've had some amazing experiences here on campus. Nikita Tani Party and um, Mary Johnson, both seniors, right? Yeah. All right, I was going to say that. I'm saying it with a question mark because I wasn't quite certain. And you are joined by um, Juliet Mayinje. Correct. All right, I've been practicing the name. I'm glad I got it straight. And you are the study abroad director for the Greece program? Correct, yes. Okay, well, we are going to talk to all three of you, but we'll get started, I guess, right here uh, with uh, Nikita. Tell me a little bit about your study abroad experience. Um, so I've never been to Greece or the Mediterranean. I loved olives, and I was like, well, I should go to Greece. <laughs> that is a good reason. Um, and I took classes in archaeology and art history, things I had never learned about before. And it was literally like living a study abroad experience. You weren't just learning in the classroom. We like to say we learn beyond it. Um, and you learn with the people there and with the community. And it was just, I just wish I could go back and do it again <laughs> for longer. And what semester were you there? Um, fall of junior year. So you missed a football season. I for did. This. I missed the best. You missed the football season. I know. Season and for I was this. friends with someone from USC there. We were watching the games together. And it was great. It was just fantastic. It was sad not to be here. But, um, you're always part of Notre Dame wherever you are. So you okay. could still experience yeah. it abroad. Mm -hmm. All right, and how about you, Mary? What was your experience? I was actually abroad with Nikita um, in Athens, same time. And so, you know, we were friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, I absolutely loved it. Greece is so magical because you're, you're in a totally different place. It's a totally different culture. You could wander the streets and maybe not bump into anybody who speaks English, maybe get pretty lost. Um, <laughs> but everyone there is so kind, so nice. Um, it's just a really beautiful country. It was a really beautiful place. I didn't know anything about the classics either, and now I'm a classics minor. I absolutely love it. So, And Juliet, these two women had an extraordinary experience abroad, but I'm sure you see this story repeated over and over again in your, in your area of work. Tell us a little bit about the students who come through your doors and, and the ones that you send all the way over to Greece. You know, Abby, um, regarding the students, it's very interesting. Some of them know what they want. Some of them are unsure and they need a little bit of convincing. Sounds Greece, a little bit like life. Yeah. Greece <laughs> is not a typical destination for Notre Dame students, and I'm so proud of these young women who took the chance on Greece because it is a magical place, as they've, they've uh, articulated here. But when they go out there, they become more worldly. I mean, they gain the global experiences that we get so proud of to send out Notre Dame students who can interact with anybody, anywhere in this world. And to be honest, I was thinking about this and saying, you know, this year, 2014, we're marking our 50th year since study abroad at Notre Dame. And I don't know whether Notre Dame Day knew this or not, but we are marking our 50th year since we started sending students. And I'm so proud of that as well. That is certainly an extraordinary point of pride and a great, a great thing for this university. I know as a student here, we were very much encouraged to study abroad. I was mentioning earlier to Nikita and Mary, I, I went to Washington, D.C. I didn't study abroad necessarily, but the experience was still there. And it was so formative in what I determined that I wanted to do with my life. And did you guys find that? Obviously, you're now a classics minor, Mary. What kind of influence did, did the study abroad program have on your trajectory in life? Well, like I said, now I'm a classics mm -hmm. minor. Um, I work here on a uh, student advisory board to Notre Dame International. It's called FIND. We try to get the student voice into all things Notre Dame International, be it study abroad, even research, um, and, and service, and all those kind of things. Um, 
Honestly, study abroad, it opens your eyes to, to new experiences, to new worlds. It makes you leave your comfort zone, um, but in a great way. And when you come back, you're definitely, definitely a different person. All right, Nikita, if I remember correctly from our meeting last night, this is in a way a study abroad yeah. for you as it is. Yeah. You're from India. Yeah. What made you decide that you wanted to study abroad even though you've already taken this huge leap and come so far for school? Yeah, people said, you're already abroad. Why are you going abroad again? I'm an economics major and I took no classes about economics, but it's, it's like Mary said, it's more than just learning new things and learning a new culture. It's about living a new life, but then reflecting on it as a Notre Dame student, you know? You're gonna, you only have four short years here, but then spending one year abroad affects so many other parts of your life here. Um, you can never experience too many places, so even though I was abroad here, I wanted to go see something new, completely different. And as an economics major, I, it was amazing, especially because Greece is such a turbulent, changing economy, but to talk to people and learn about it meant so much more than to just you know, learn it in a classroom. All right, and you two are both seniors. What's next? Um, I'll be back in India again, um, working for a development economics lab through M uh, Harvard and MIT, and I'm intimidated but excited. I'm intimidated just hearing that. That's impressive. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Nikita. And how about you, Mary? Um, I'm going to be doing Teach for America in Houston, Texas, so I'm terrified <laughs> but excited too. I was going to say, that's equally intimidating <laughs> yeah. in a completely different way, and I know Julia probably agrees with me. You guys are obviously a wonderful example of what Notre Dame has to offer, so thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. And now that uh, you are graduating, I hope you have a couple of trips left to some of the great landmarks here on campus, and we're going to go ahead and join uh, Amanda Starantino, who is out at one of those landmarks, the Basilica of the Sacred Heart. Amanda, good morning. Okay. Here we go. Thanks, Abby. I'm here at the Basilica of the Sacred Heart with Father David Scheidler of the Congregation of Holy Cross. And you serve as the Basilica Associate Director. And many of us have been in and out. And we don't, we, we're here all the time, but we don't know too much about it. So why don't you tell us, when did the Basilica first open its doors? It opened its doors um, for, there were several buildings that actually came before this. This is the third building that was used in this in this space. In 1888, it was consecrated um, and for use and the, by the Bishop of Fort Wayne at the time, Bishop Dwenger. And so that means that we're celebrating right now our 125th anniversary. Uh, we've been open since 1888, basically. The cornerstone was laid before then in 1871, but we weren't able to really fully function until 1888. But that still meant that part of the basilica, like the part of the Lady Chapel, the top of the spire weren't completed until years later. Okay, well, happy anniversary. And so when did it receive the distinction of being named a basilica? It was named a minor basilica in, eight, in 1992 by Pope Paul, now St. Paul, John Paul II. Um, a minor basilica distinguishes itself from a major basilica in simply that it's not in Rome. There are only four major basilicas and they're all inside Rome. And then uh, the other minor basilicas or any other basilica you find outside of Rome. So we were given that distinction in 1992 and that's designated by two symbols that you'll see here inside the church, which is the, the little umbrella looking thing. Um, and then the tintinabulum, which is a portable bell. Those were used as honorifics in case the Pope ever comes to visit. We'll have something to shade his head and to announce his walking around. You know, you ring the bell and that sort of thing. You know, I always wondered that in Mass what those were. I've never seen them in any other church I have been in. And so what's the story behind the stained glass windows that surround pretty much the entire basilica? They are one of the most complete um, examples of French stained glass from the 19th century. So much of the church uh, stained glass that you see today in Europe either predates that or is from later or is a, uh, as a restoration because Europe suffered so many wars and stuff. So we have one of the most complete sets. They were built or uh, constructed by a company in Le Mans, France, where our congregation was founded. And they were executed by um, a group of Carmelite nuns, as a matter of fact. And um, they were uh, designed by someone named Eugène Houchet. And, but they were installed then here where there are about 144 stained glass windows. We have, um, or 44, excuse me, and there are 114 saints that are depicted on them that include a pretty good size, full size image of the saint and then a little story that kind of tells why they're a saint somewhere above or below them. 
So. Okay, and the ceilings, the stained glass windows are beautiful, but the ceilings, I've definitely caught many people in mass instead yeah. of looking at the altar, just looking straight yeah. up. Yeah. So who painted them and how long did it take? It could not have been easy. No, it took several years. Uh, he was, his name was Luigi Gregori. He was um, commissioned by the um, then Pope Pius IX of Blessed. And um, he was also our in-resident um, art director of art here for the university. And so he used many students, teachers, faculty, and even Holy Cross priests and brothers as his models for doing the various murals, including our 14 Stations of the Cross. They were executed by him as well. Okay, and thank you so much. And there is so much more to learn about the Basilica, but we just don't have time. And thanks for joining us this morning, and back over to you, Abby. All right, thanks so much, Amanda. And we have a very special guest on the phone, United States Senator Joe Donnelly. Senator, thank you so much for getting up this morning and taking time to be part of the Notre Dame Day celebration. Oh, thank you so much. Go Irish. Go Irish. I know Notre Dame has been a big part of your life. You are what we call a double domer. You're in two degrees from Notre Dame, and you even met your wife here. So absolutely, I have to ask you, what are your fondest memories of Notre Dame? But I think you're kind of under obligation to respond meeting your wife, right? <laughs> that would be true. <laughs> but right, it would so also be true. To that. <laughs> and, uh, the, the other part was, uh, it, you know, I, I happen to live in a dorm Holy Cross Hall that is actually no longer uh, in existence. It was on the other side of the lake, off on the hill. And back in the time when I went to school, I graduated in 77, you would get a pamphlet before you uh, uh, headed out to Notre Dame, and the pamphlet would list the dorms, and they would be listed actually by price. And... Uh, Holy Cross Hall was the cheapest dorm on campus. <laughs> cheapest dorm on campus, maybe, but I'm sure a place where it was, I think it was Carroll Hall was always the one that they said it's far away from everything, but it's where some of the best memories are made for those individuals who have the opportunity to live there and take advantage of, of the view, I guess. And since you're a senator from Indiana, we know you get back here to campus very often. What makes you most proud of your association with Notre Dame on your trips back? Do you hear something? Just the amazing things that the people are doing and the accomplishments that you see all the time. Wave to me if you hear me. And uh, uh, Dublin, the, Dublin, do you hear South Bend? Wave to me if you hear the, me. Uh, yes. um, amazing things that yes, our people are able to Okay, accomplish. good. Just want to make sure you were hearing us. Thank you very much. You'll be on next. All right, as a Notre Dame alumnus, I know you're very familiar with the iconic phrase, God, country, Notre Dame. As a United States Senator, you have a unique perspective on the potential and the impact of Notre Dame and its alumni can have on this country and around the world. Can you talk a little bit about what you've seen in your experience? Sure, everywhere I go, I see Notre Dame folks. I was in Afghanistan with our troops, and this young lady came up and uh, talked to me, and she was in the process of working with some of the tribal elders in some of the provinces in Afghanistan, and it turned out she was an Army ROTC graduate from Notre Dame, has uh, done amazing things in her career, and that's through every different area, whether it is medical research, whether it is finance work that is trying to bring a uh, more effective, more responsible finance system. And so Notre Dame's spirit, Notre Dame's um, beliefs permeate throughout the world. And I know we have a couple of other Notre Dame grads on the Hill. I think they might be Republicans. Does Notre Dame help bring you guys together? Oh, yeah. We don't ever worry about uh, Republican or Democrat. It's actually um, what bonds us all together is that we want to be Southern Cal. So. That's right. Hey, that's, that's a good common denominator. And how do your fellow senators treat you during the college football season? Well, um, they never come up and say much when we win. But when we lose, they, uh, they are all there ready to talk to me about it. But, Isn't that crazy how uh, that it's, works? It's yeah. great to be part of. All right. And care to make a prediction on the upcoming football season for the Irish? Well, it looks to me like we're going to have a great year. And uh, I, I just have to say to all the young people who... Uh, we're involved in our sports. Uh, the women's basketball team in Muffet just had an amazing year. I saw yesterday that the lacrosse team won the ACC uh, uh, tournament. And so we're incredibly blessed to have wonderful young people who are such great uh, uh, athletes, such great people, such great students. Um, it, it, there's no words that could ever uh, explain what Notre Dame has meant to our state and to our country. It really is a special place, and I know you probably joined me in the uh, in taking great pride in the proud to be ND statement. So thank you so much, Senator Donnelly, for taking time to be part of this Notre Dame Day celebration. We're so glad you could join us. Thank you so much.
All right, and now we're gonna check in with another group. We are trotting the globe this morning and we're gonna go to Dublin. I understand we've got a, a Skype interview lined up with some folks in Ireland, is that right? Yeah. All right, good morning, everybody. Or I say good morning, what time is it there? It is just uh, after a quarter past noon right now. Oh my gosh, well then, I would say thank you for getting up early, but I'm not gonna thank you for getting <laughs> up early. That's not fair. I do see someone in a shirt. I, would, I had the privilege of going to the Notre Dame game in, in Ireland, was it uh, a little over a year ago, almost two years ago now, in that Ireland sweatshirt with the ND at the end. I would search high and low to get my hands on that, so I'm very envious, and I wanna know after this where you got that shirt, and if, I, if there's any way I can get my hands on one now. Well, good morning to you all, and I guess I should say good afternoon. Where are you celebrating? Where exactly are you in, in Dublin? So we're right in the heart of the city centre in Marion Square, uh, just in a beautiful Georgian building called O'Connell House. Okay, and who all is there with you? I, we won't introduce everybody, but if you want to give us a quick rundown of, of uh, you have, what year students are we joining? Are joining oh us? yeah, okay, so we have our, um, our year-long students uh, that are studying at Trinity College Dublin, and we have semester students who are at UCD, University College Dublin. Uh, we have some Nocton Fellows, and then we have the uh, OC team as well. So we've got Louise and Rachel and our director, Kevin, here. All right, well, a great crowd joining us. And do you guys have class today? <laughs> is it, is that a collective? Of course we do. But they're in studying. This is, this, is a, this is a learning experience in and of itself. And so you guys have been there for the full year. You missed the football season, I'm guessing, several of you. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Worth it? Uh, I think so. I mean, Definitely. <laughs> it was sad watching. We had late night uh, game watches from Dublin, which were still pretty fun. What time do the games come on there? Oh, God. Pretty late. We stayed up until about 5 a.m. watching the Michigan game. Wow, that is dedication. So don't let anybody <laughs> tell you that you missed a football season. It takes more effort to get up at that hour than it does to tailgate and go to the games here on <laughs> campus, right? All right, and so now several of you, are you juniors, sophomores, or a mix of both? Juniors. 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 All right. And what's a, what's in store for senior year? Anybody got big plans? <laughs> yeah. Or are you not up, thinking yeah. past the trip back? Thesis research, all sorts of stuff, looking at grad schools, yeah. <laughs> You've got plenty of time to decide. Any of you going to be living on campus when you come back? Let's do a show of hands. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Any Breen Phillips girls in there? No. 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 Nobody. All right. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us again. I'm not going to give you credit for getting up early. That's just not fair. But thank you for joining us at lunch hour. We appreciate it. And we are going to go to. Let's see. I'm hearing two different things. So are we going to a phone interview? All right. We're going to we're going to be joined on the phone now with Eliza Getney, who has an incredible story to share. Good morning, Eliza. Thank you so much for getting up. You're in Boston, Massachusetts, correct? Um, I'm actually in Connecticut right now. I apologize. But yeah, You're in early. Connecticut. So it's the association with Boston that I am leaning on right now because you have, as we mentioned, an amazing story. A year ago, right now, you were injured in the Boston Marathon bombing. So take us back to a year ago right now on April 15th. You're walking down Boylston Street about a block from your apartment in Boston. And what happened next? Um, yeah, so I, I was walking and I was going to meet up with friends and I thought I would just admire um, the people who were finishing the race. And I was just walking down the street. Um, it was like an amazing day. Um, I looked over to my right. I was right at the finish line um, and then the bomb went off right behind me. And what has your life been like since that day? Uh, it's been different. <laughs> um, I was injured physically, but um, compared to a lot of people, I was really lucky. Um, and mostly I've been dealing with a lot of PTSD. Um, I moved back to my parents' house in Connecticut, and I've just been trying to recover since. It is an amazing ordeal to have to go through. And you graduated in 2011, and you yeah. were just back there for the marathon. And, and you weren't there as a runner, as I understand, over you know when you were injured. You were just there as a bystander, you said. And yeah. so, but this year you decided to not only go back, but you were actually a runner. Is that correct? Yeah. So um, 
the Boston Athletic Association offered everyone who was injured two entries um, to the 2014 marathon. So um, at first I, I was a little hesitant, <laughs> um, but the more I thought about it and I, I had some people convincing me, um, I decided to run it and kind of take back that day. It's, so, it's such a brave thing for you to do on so many levels. I, in my lifetime, have only run as far as a half marathon, and that was such a difficult experience. What was it like? Were you a runner at all previously, or was this your first time ever doing any distance running? Um, I had done a half marathon, the holy half, at Notre Dame um, when I was there, but that was a long time ago, uh, four or five years ago. I'm not really sure. But um, I hadn't been running, and... E after the marathon, I had surgery and stuff, so I wasn't really exercising at all. Um, so it was kind of, you know, I I started running. Uh, I had to start at like one mile. Do you copy audio? It's certainly a, a mile by mile. I know everybody talks about South the whole couch Skype? to 5K thing very jokingly, but it takes a lot to get up and to be able to run any amount of distance. And, and I'm sure each mile meant something to you, but let's start at the very beginning and at the starting line. What was going through your head when you were getting ready to go this, this last couple, this last week, I guess it was? Um, I was excited when I first woke up. Um, and we had to be in Hoffington very early. Our bus left at like 5.30 and I didn't start till 11.25. So I had a lot of time to think about it. And I was just really anxious to start. But once I got there, um, it was really scary because it, I had some flashbacks. There were helicopters. Um, when I looked up on the roof, there was so much security. There were snipers on the roof at the starting line. Um, so I started to get really nervous and I, I kind of panicked a little bit. But once we started running, I was fine. And were you alone in that or were you surrounded by other people who'd been through a similar experience with the, the last marathon? Well, I had my best friend with me. Um, she agreed to run with me, which was amazing. So we did all of our training together, my best friend from Connecticut. And then I also had my support group of, um, there were 28 of us who were injured in the marathon that trained and ran um, this year. So I got to know them all really well and we, we were together all morning. And we've seen all of the pictures of those amazing individuals who decided to take back that day, as you mentioned. What has that network meant to you, being a part of that group and the bond I'm sure that you have formed that will stick with you for your lifetime? Oh, it means everything. Um, I was alone that day and so for a couple weeks, I really had nobody to talk um, about the experience with. Um, so once I met all of these people and joined the support group, they've really become a second family to me. And as you were running through those streets, surrounded by all of these people, what was it like as you hit each mile marker and, and those familiar sights were coming back to you, but at the same time you had, you had to keep one foot in front of the other? Um, it was surreal. There were so many people there. And I just kept saying to my friend, like, we're running the Boston Marathon right now. This is really happening. Um, and once I started getting closer to Boylston Street, again, I had some moments of panic. But my friend Liza, who was running with me, she helped calm me down, and we just kind of got through it together. I wouldn't have been able to do it without her. And were you two together when you saw the finish line? Yeah, we stayed together the whole race, which is pretty hard to do. That is impressive. And what were you thinking about as you saw that finish line approaching? Um, I was like, thank God, because I was in a lot of pain, but um, it was it was really emotional. I was kind of crying a little bit and um, looking toward where the bomb happened last year, and I was just I was really ready to rewrite those memories and kind of cross the finish line this year um, on my own terms. And not only did you cross the finish line on your own terms, but you made this a mission, it sounds like. I understand you raised a considerable amount of money for the Boston One Fund, which supports and provides aid to all the bombing victims. Is that right? Yeah, we raised $21,852. Wow, that's, uh, that is something to be enormously proud of. And you are getting ready to go back to work. You've got so much ahead of you. What are your plans? Are you excited? Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. Um, I kind of feel like I closed that chapter in my life, and now I can move forward. Uh, I have one ear surgery ahead of me in May, and then after that I'm going to try and uh, get back up on my feet and see what happens. 
Well, as you get back on your feet, I can promise you, you have the Notre Dame family behind you. And before we let you go, I, I do want to shift focus a little bit back here to campus. You're a 2011 grad. You haven't been gone that long. What do you miss most about your time at Notre Dame? Oh, I miss my friends. <laughs> I really miss my friends. Um, they're all over the, the country and even the world. So um, uh, we, we keep in touch as best we can, but it's always better when I get to see them. Well, Eliza, on behalf of the entire Notre Dame family, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Good luck to you. I am certain I am not alone in wishing you the very best, and I'm sure you have so much ahead of you. So congratulations on finishing the marathon, and good luck to you. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. And now we are going to take another turn. We've gone from Dublin to Connecticut, and I think we are going to try to go to Beijing. So good morning, Beijing. I'm not sure. I'm saying good morning, Beijing. I have no idea what time it is in Beijing. <laughs> yeah, it's nighttime here. It's nighttime. What nighttime. time in the nighttime? <laughs> good evening to you. What time is it there, folks? Are you hearing me okay? Should I should I start miming? No, no, we can hear you fine. All right, well, what are you guys up to? Are you tuning into Notre Dame Day together? Where are you exactly? It looks like you're in a basement. Are you in a bunker? <laughs> <laughs> we're, at, we're at the uh, now very well established Beijing Club restaurant hangout that uh, we and Joanna are just, op oops, just opening today. Oh, congratulations. That's awesome. I'm going to blame Skype. It, I, can, I can only see the, uh, the bars in the background. So, so exciting. What a big day you have ahead. And what are you guys, uh, wh who, who else do you have celebrating with you? Tell us about your connection to the university. We have one alumni who traveled all the way from the U.S. Sort of Just to participate in this, right? That's dedication. Who can go? Why go to campus when you can go to Beijing? And you're joining. Yeah. I said, why go to campus when you can go to Beijing? You've got. You're halfway around the world. How often do you guys get back here? Exactly. How often do we get back? You know, it's a, it's just a direct flight from Chicago, so no big deal. No big deal. You just flight. Yeah. That's where I came from. <laughs> All right, and if you could tell the Notre Dame family one thing they should know about the Notre Dame Club of Beijing on Notre Dame Day, what would it be? It's all about fellowship. Anywhere you go in the world, you will find Notre Dame friends who will join you for anything. That seems to be true no matter where you look in the globe. And, and you guys have come together over a shared love of Notre Dame, so I think it's only appropriate that I ask you, what do you love most about Notre Dame? You can nominate one person to answer, or hey, we can go all the way around, whatever you feel like doing. Boy, I mean, <clears throat> that's tough to say one thing. I, I, I love the school, I love the academics, I love the network, and uh, the fellowship we have when we go back to the U.S. or when we're here. Fellowship, that's my network. I think the fellowship, I heard that, that's a great answer. What, in, in the one thing that unites all domers here and abroad, a shared passion for football, anticipation for the next season. So what is your prediction for the upcoming football season? Who's got one? <laughs> well, you know, one thing we can say is that we watched, what, six games uh, live last year at the club here in Beijing. So more night games and dust for me. We, we all can time difference. <laughs> so you guys are tailgating no matter where you are. Nicely done. Thank you for joining us all the way from Beijing. We hope you have a great time celebrating Notre Dame Day. And we're going to head over to the social media center right now. We've got Amanda Sarantino there, and she is going to give us, bring us up to speed on everything that's happening online. Good morning, Amanda. Hey, Abby. Yes, I am here in the Social Media Command Center, where it seems to be one of the biggest parts of Notre Dame Day. And we're here with Wendy Angst and Stu Fortner, who are making all of the magic happen. Go for it, guys. Thank you, Amanda. So we are in the exciting command center of the social media site for Notre Dame Day. And Notre Dame Day website, you can see here, you just simply go to this site, you click the big green button, and that's where you can make the magic happen. You click there to vote, and you can um, help allocate where funding should go from the university. But what we're tracking here is the chatter that's happening through Instagram, through Pinterest, through Facebook, and through Twitter. 
And through our middle screen here, you can see we're watching the live tweets as they come in. Hello, Beijing, one of the first uh, tweets that just came in talking about our, uh, our family over there in, in Beijing. So please um, log on to our website here, give and vote, include the hashtag, hashtag ND Day, and hashtag proud to be ND, and we'll see your messaging come through. And turn it over to Stu. Thanks, Wendy. So we're going to go on the leaderboard right now. And it, as of right now, we have 963 total gifts and just at $508,000. When, as Wendy said, when you, make a, when you make a gift, you can vote for anything in academics to athletics, to our centers and institutes, mission and service, clubs and associations. I'll, I'll highlight right now Colorado Springs is the leader in the clubhouse right now. For uh, alumni clubs, you can also vote for Student Life. Uh, Morrissey is in the lead right now for the, the dorms. So Dylan and Keenan are second and third. Get on, you know, have a cup of coffee, give and vote. And if you look at the, look at the total uh, leaders right now, financial aid is in uh, top vote getter with Morrissey, undergraduate business, Dylan Hall, and rowing and athletics are, are uh, come up in fifth. So as you can see, we're wearing green hats, and we're gonna be wearing green hats until we get 1,000 total gifts. So hopefully after the next hour, we will get out of our green hats, and uh, we'll go to uh, Amanda, who will go to where we're gonna be at the next, uh, the next hour, and I think I need to change that. I'm actually, I got my mic over here, oh, but okay. <laughs> so being in the Social Media Command Center, they got me all dressed up too. So the next hour, do not log off just yet. There's a live visit to the South Bend Dining Hall, and Anna Thompson with the DeBartolo Performing Arts Center will talk to us too, and then we'll head over to Bob Mundy of the class of 1976 with admissions, and even more, Mary Nucciaroni with financial aid, very important for all students that go here, and a live visit with the Notre Dame Club of Minnesota. So stay tuned with Notre Dame Day.